Welcome to the Educate, Empower, and Evolve podcast. I'm Haley Vera, holistic lifestyle coach and founder of Health Pillars Online Lifestyle Coaching. I started this podcast to share the knowledge that has helped hundreds of my clients take control of their health and step into their power. I believe that true empowerment stems from a deep understanding of your body and mind. And my hope is that this podcast will provide you the education and knowledge you need to make lasting change in your life. I want you to not only feel better, but become your absolute best self by optimizing your internal health and going beyond the physical realm, mastering your mindset and developing a strong connection with your inner being. If you want to evolve and perform not only at a high level in your personal and professional life, but also experience a profound sense of fulfillment and purpose, then you are in the right place. I'm committed to helping you live a life that reflects your truest capabilities. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's dive into today's episode. All right, my friends, welcome back to the E3 podcast. Today, we have a very special episode, and I actually brought back Jake. Jake's been on the podcast a couple of times now. So, Jake, welcome. Hey, hey. What's going on? How's your day been so far? Good. Actually, speaking of, um, I was just bathing myself in the sun, so which we'll be talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know as the weather is getting warmer and we're getting this longer daylight and more sunshine, you can just really feel your mood and everything start to kind of increase, right? Your energy levels, your mood balance. Um, I just find for myself that it has such a big impact on my ability to focus throughout the day as well. I sometimes find like in the winter time that I get distracted a lot more easily. Um, so the sunshine can just really help me personally, um, during this kind of increase in, in daylight hours, I noticed that massively in the spring and I'm sure a lot of people do. And that's why we're kind of talking today. We talk a little bit about the missing link for health. And I know yesterday we had a bit of a conversation around this and how, um, what was the, the context you used it around with like ADHD and like being outdoors in nature, there was, there was oh, kind of N- NDD nature deficit disorder. Yeah. So you, you were saying that a lot of people um, are being diagnosed with ADHD, but really what we're seeing is, is this nature deficit disorder or NDD as you called it. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting because just what I said right there about like being able to have more focus, more energy, more attention span, um, just with having a little bit more daylight, like it makes sense. Right. So at first I just want to talk a little bit about, about light, but um I kind of want to go a little bit into your background and and your healing with red light and red light therapy because mm-hmm. you got me into red light. I actually had very little knowledge around that red light, very little experience with it. I never used it until I met you. And now we have the red light set up in the garage and I literally use them every single morning. And so prior to like meeting you and being more introduced to this, I'd never really given it much thought to be completely honest with you. Um, and I know that you've actually used red light yourself in your healing process when you came off of Um, a lot of the anabolic steroids that you used earlier in life and you were working on repairing your hormones naturally. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Can you give us just a little bit of some insight into um, coming off of uh, like steroid abuse or steroid use, I suppose, and, and how you used light, red light or nature exposure to nature um, to actually help heal yourself? Yeah. So definitely it was abuse. It was in my earlier twenties. I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder. I got surrounded by the wrong people. And I just got into using and abusing steroids, as most people, most men in that age do. And um, it was about age of like, I I was on and off of them, but pretty much on for about four years, orals and injectables. And I I came to a realization that I need to come off this stuff because I don't want to take it for the rest of my life. And it just affected everything, my relationships with people around me, uh, It just compounded body dysmorphia, it compounded uh, the anxiety that I was already having. And at the end of the day, I made that decision to come off. I came off incorrectly and it put me down a rabbit hole uh, with my health. My testosterone was tested. It was that of like a 90 year old man who didn't exercise. Um, It was like, I think 71. And it literally got me to the point where I was seeing specialists, four medical doctors I saw in two years. And I saw two naturopathic doctors that were in my school. And at the same time, I was learning about holistic health, but my knowledge wasn't where it was. And medical doctors were reluctant to uh, put me on hormonal replacement therapy. Naturopaths were doing advanced testing. Uh, so it was a lot going on within those two years. And it wasn't like back to back. It was like a couple months in between appointments. And I was just kind of lost. I was like, I need to do something here to get my levels back because I literally had no drive just to wake up and do anything. Like 
if anybody knows anything about hormones, especially for men, when testosterone is really low, you just don't want to do anything. You have like, you have no motivation, drive, inspiration. You just wake up and you're like, uh, why am I even here? You just want to go back to bed and you just have no energy. There's many layers to it. Um, and you know, through school and through listening to a bunch of podcasts, it was like, it came apparent to me that there's a lot of different missing links to health that we aren't really taught about and we aren't aware. And it led me down the path of obviously not only changing my nutrition, but being more inclined to understanding these free things that we've evolved with, right? Light being one of them, cold, heat, that's kind of where everything sparked for me. Uh, earthing as well was a massive one. And I started to go down a rabbit hole. The one, the first guy who got me exposed to it was Dr. Joseph Mercola. And he was talking about red light therapy or photobiomodulation and red light we'll talk a little bit more about, but it's pretty much a part of the spectrum of light. It's about makes up 40% of sunlight, give or take 40, 41% of sunlight. And it has all these therapeutic benefits. And there's literally thousands of studies on human health. And there was a particular study I remember he mentioned about testosterone, but it was done on mice, right? It wasn't done on humans where they exposed red light in a specific wavelength. It was like 670 uh, nanometers on the testicles of male rats. And they saw that the t testosterone literally elevated. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was like these, these claims that when you fast for long periods of time, your growth hormone gets elevated. I'm like, it's worth a try. So I bought these lights from sauna space, these red lights that pretty much mimic the sunlight, um, red light, near infrared light, which we'll talk more about. And I got myself a setup and I started to do it every single day, twice a day for like 10 minutes, specifically in the lower parts, because anytime re red light is very local. So the body part that you're trying to treat, if you're treating that body part specifically with the red light, then it's going to have a better effect as opposed to just treating your upper body. And let's say you have an injury in your lower leg. It doesn't work like systemically, right? You want most of your body parts um, being affected by the light. So I started doing that. And I instantly noticed, like, I mean, I don't know if, if I could go into this detail. You don't care how much I share. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't care how much you share. You can go ahead. Yeah. So for me, like when testosterone is low, like you, you don't have erections as men. Right. And that was a big thing. And I was in a relationship and it was really, it was like compounding. And when I started doing this, the first session I did, I started to, <laughs> I got an erection, like literally seven or eight minutes in. And I didn't even control it just came out of nowhere. And I was just like, shit, even if this is a placebo, there's something to this, right? So that was like the basis of my, my healing therapy, uh, alongside obviously nutrition, doing a lot of earthing, just reducing as much stress as I can and giving the body what it's missing. Uh, and light being one of those things is we're recently calling it vitamin S for sunshine or vitamin L for light. Um, there's so many, many benefits, but that was definitely one of the things that I did religiously for like months and months on end. And there, other than that, there's a lot of other health benefits that we'll definitely discuss, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to continue using it and to see the benefits. And I'm going to keep taking progress photos of my face specifically, um, because as we've talked about, I really struggled with acne when I was younger and never was I told that red light could be a potential therapy for that. Uh, and there's a lot of research out there that actually do red light therapy just on half of there's some studies out there that show half of someone's face. So they'll do half the face with red light and it has improvements around uh, collagen production in the skin. So like actually firming and tightening the skin, but also reducing lesions and speeding up the healing of acne scarring and reducing inflammation uh, in the face. So reducing inflammatory, um, I guess kind of like cystic acne. So reducing inflammation in the pores, et cetera. So that was never something that was exposed to me, but my skin ever since then has been very like thin almost. I used a lot of really harsh chemicals on my face um, along with the antibiotics to try to obviously clear that up. And now I'm starting to do things um, as I get into my thirties and I can actually afford it. I'm starting to do things like laser therapy, et cetera, for my skin to try and bring it the collagen back because obviously that amount of damage to my skin at a young age, I felt like my collagen um, production in my skin was like really poor. Right. And I was starting to notice that. So the red light's been really helping me. I've noticed my skin feels a lot more vibrant. Um, I've obviously been doing that in conjunction with other therapy as, as well. So like better skincare and then obviously the laser treatments too, but we're going to dive into red light a little bit more specifically in this podcast, but I really want to talk about this missing link just as light as a whole, because so many of us sit in little tiny cubicles or boxes or offices or stuck in our house for hours on end, or we live in concrete jungles, we live in the city, um, and we're essentially in mazes all day long that are not exposed to daylight. We're in underground parking lots, then we're taking the elevator up to our office building that has, maybe it has glass windows, but and there's day, quote unquote daylight coming in, but you're not actually getting the therapeutic uh, benefits of sunshine through a window. It doesn't work like that. So even if you do have windows in your bedroom or your office, 
it's not going to be having the same effect as actually being outside with bare skin and being exposed to that. The other thing too, is like, maybe this, I'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist in this, but I actually feel like there's so much misinformation around sunshine and daylight. And there's this huge push to like cover up from the sun and wear sunscreen and sunglasses and all these things. But it's like, if you're healthy and your body actually has the proper nutrients to like produce collagen, et cetera, like being in the sun is actually great for your skin and it's great for your eyes. Um, obviously you don't want to look directly at the sunshine when it's like overhead, but like when it's rising and setting, um, that's a different story. And there's so much misinformation out there of like cover up, wear sunscreen and people are almost like afraid of the sun, which is so crazy to me. And there's this massive fear around skin cancer, but in my opinion, skin cancer is, is obviously something very serious, but it's going to come from more so like the, the oxidative stress within the body. And if you're not cleaning that up with your nutrition, or you're adding to that with things like alcohol or stress or smoking, et cetera, you're going to be at a higher risk for things like skin cancer. That's just kind of my opinion. Anyways, I think if you're healthy, being in the sunshine is going to be healthy for you. Do you what's your kind of take on that? Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of it's a business, right? Like sunscreen is a multi-billion dollar business. Um, in the context of potentially living in northern latitudes in the winter, if you're to go to somewhere subtropical, then maybe the, there's there's some merit to doing something like that, obviously, because you're going from one extreme to the other. And humans, we never had airplanes. We never traveled across time zones so quickly. We had adaptations, which is our tan. And when we're talking about like cancers of the skin, melanoma, for example, uh, there's been studies, Mercola have talk, has talked about this as well. It's because we don't build a base level of tan and we don't have enough melanin and we're actually suppressing the UVB um, and we're not even getting the red light, which actually stimulates uh, melanin production, which actually helps us get a tan. And that's funny because that's the red light is the first light we should be exposed to. And then obviously red light kind of dissipates when the sun is higher, you get higher propensities of UVB. And then obviously the sun is a lot stronger later in the day. But if we understand the natural rhythm of the sun, and if we as humans evolved with it, the, the humans never had skin cancer, right? Like it was rare. The cases started to happen like in this last century, essentially. Before that, it's almost impossible to find anything. I'm sure there's outliers here and there, but it's something that's like a massive, massive industry. And there's a lot of money to be made, right? And it, 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 sunglasses, you mentioned this too. This is interesting because uh, sunglasses, obviously the only context me personally I wear it is like if I'm snowboarding or fishing on a lake and obviously the glare coming off of off of the, the water or the snow, that's gonna be hard. But this has been even shown that wearing sunglasses worsens your eyesight because we naturally have these photoreceptors in our eyes and our eyes tend to squint when we aren't, wear, we aren't wearing sunglasses, right? To naturally protect us. And the thing is your body can, it almost has melanops, it has melanopsin receptors in your eyes and that's how you actually produce melanin. So even if your skin is getting contact from the sun, it has to go through your eyes, right? And when you're wearing sunglasses, your eyes don't naturally dilate and they don't actually squint. So you're actually technically leaving them fully open to be exposed because that UVB and UVA is still penetrating through it. It's just, you're almost like putting a bandaid on your eyes, right? So like this rabbit hole, this it's not conspiracy theory because this has been talked about a lot, but there's a lot of benefits to not wearing sunglasses, especially if you're trying to optimize your health, unless those certain contexts I talk about um, where you absolutely need to, but I wouldn't say you should be wearing them all the time. So. Yeah, I think like you said, like specific times of day, like if the sun is directly overhead, or oh, maybe you're driving and for safety purposes, like you don't want to be blinded when you're driving, then wearing sunglasses obviously has some merit, but allowing yourself to be in nature without trying to change the way that nature interacts with your body, because light is a form of electromagnetic therapy, right? Um, it's electro electromagnetic energy, and that is very therapeutic. It actually influences everything that it touches. Like just think about the way that it influences plants, right? The way that plants grow in uh, when there's sun sunshine or daylight that they're able to be exposed to. And at the same time, like you'll see flowers, right? Like flowers turn their face up towards the sun, right? Right. They're actually being more receptive to the sunlight and just a very simple, like obvious interaction that we all know about is that how light interacts with our body to produce vitamin D, right? Vitamin D is produced when the UVB rays from light interact with our skin cholesterol. And that is kind of initiates the production of vitamin D within the body, which is essential for, I mean, I, we could go down so many different pathways with vitamin D and what it actually does, um, but bone health, immune function, um, sex hormones, it's all, all very important for that. So 
you know, I think that we can really get caught up in um, trying to protect ourselves. But if you actually just look at the human body and how it interacts with nature, it does it best when it's organic, when we're not trying to interfere with it, when we're not trying to get in the way of it or change the way that um, that we're meant to kind of interact with those things, like the way that we're supposed to interact with sunshine, for example, right? If we're trying to interfere with that by applying sunscreen or constantly wearing sunglasses, or we're just in a sense, we're just not being exposed to it at all, then we're essentially not able to actually, um, I don't even want to say live like a healthy life, but I say like just for baseline health, we need light. Would you argue the same? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, for everything, you just, you just go crazy. And most people know you get the seasonal affective disorder. And it's not just because of vitamin D there's a lot more nuance to it than that, but we as humans evolved with the sun period. So um, yeah. We evolved from equator equatorial countries, essentially, and then we propagated north and south. So it's a part of our biology, period. Like you can't neglect it. Yeah. So it's not just humans. It's not just plants. It's like all animals, all organisms respond to light. Um, light is bioactive and then it elicits a cellular response, which is what we're going to be talking about today and what kind of cellular responses we can get from red light in terms of the benefits or the healing effects that can have the therapeutic benefits of uh, being exposed to um, red light. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the other kind of spectrums of light first, just briefly before we get into red light um, and the kind of like the wavelength. So basically light it travels similarly to radio waves. Um, so propagates in waves or wavelengths, kind of like the way I said, like radio or sound travels and they can be shorter or longer waves essentially. And so if we start looking at the different um, ways that we perceive light, I mean, I'm no expert on this and I just want to make that very clear. I've just in the last couple of days really started diving into this and listening to more podcasts on it, doing a little bit of research because I want to understand it better. And I've had a couple of people actually request that I did a podcast on red light therapy. So I was like, okay, shit, I'm going to have to learn a little bit more before I can talk about this. Um, so if you want to learn more about like the actual wavelength of light and learn more about light. Um, Ari Witten is, is the guy that I would recommend looking up. That's what Jake uh, recommended to me. He has a yeah. book, correct? I've only listened to a couple of his podcasts, but he has a book. Yeah, he has a book. Um, I mean, the biggest inspiration for him was probably the lead researcher. Uh, his name is Michael uh, Hamblin. He's yeah. like in his seventies now, and he is just constantly still looking um, and understanding the mechanisms of, of photo body biomodulation. But Ari Witten is he broke down the science essentially and came up with his own book, breaking down a lot of the popular devices out there and kind of, um, I wouldn't say, you know, shitting the bed on some of them, but shitting the bed on some of them because they, they claim to have all these health benefits, but it all comes down to essentially the power of these devices, how much, how much they can irradiate per essentially square foot. So there's a lot of good takeaway information, a lot of practical information, very easy read as well. And he has that podcast called the, Ener the energy blueprint, but Ari Witten is the guy very, very smart. He'd okay. be the expert for sure. Yeah. So if you're looking for an expert on this, you guys, and you really want to go deeper into the science uh, and maybe you even are looking to invest in, in red lights yourself. I mean, obviously I'll, I'll have Jake kind of cover that in the podcast today and give you a little bit of insight into where you could potentially purchase some good quality red lights that are, are going to be a little bit more budget friendly. Cause I know he's done that for himself. So we'll go into that um, definitely here at the end of the podcast, but um, Ari Witten's work uh, really kind of emphasizing, you know, red light therapy on the impact for mitochondrial function. And if that's something that you want to learn more deeply about, um, then that would be your guy. <clears throat> now, when we're talking about like the light spectrum, obviously you guys understand that we can break down white light into a rainbow, right? If you put white light through or a flashlight through a prism, we can actually break that light up into different colors. Okay. So those different colors are different wavelengths essentially as uh, the kind of the very basic way for me to explain that and these different wavelengths they're going to have different uh, potentials for essentially um, penetrating the body's tissues okay the shorter the wavelength the less uh, I guess the less deep <laughs> the less it's going to travel into our tissues the longer the wavelength the deeper it's going to be able to travel I think that's kind of it in a, in a nutshell do you want to add to that a little bit just from your knowledge yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. And obviously the longer the wavelength, which we're going to be talking about like near infrared, then you have far infrared, like the short wavelengths would be, I think like X-ray in UV, um, gamma. And then obviously the slower it is, it breaks down into near infrared, far infrared, or yeah, near infrared, far infrared. Then you have 
I think even microwave waves as well, but that obviously has different health implications. But <laughs> yeah, the wavelength is obviously important and depending on, it all comes down to how deep it could penetrate in terms of the tissue, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what we're going to be talking about. And the near infrared, specifically the ones I've been studied is like between 670 to like high 800s, low 900s, which falls into that perfect spectrum of near infrared, not far infrared, right? And this is where we could even talk a little bit about kind of, the fallacies of some of these saunas claiming that they give you the benefits of near infrared, but it's not necessarily the case because near infrared falls within the red light spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets very confusing for people. We could break that down as well. I was listening to a Huberman podcast, and I think that the numbers he gave was red light at 600 to 700 nanometers, kind of in that range. And then the near red light with the seven to 950 700 to 950 nanometers was the numbers that he gave. Um, mm. Now, I think that there's probably a little bit of a, a buffer there um, for sure. But I want to talk quickly about tanning because I know that a lot of people who listen to my podcast are people who love going to the gym and classic gym tan laundry. I, I, I get it. Um, you want to have a good tan. It makes your muscles look more defined and helps you to feel more confident. And look, I, I'm someone who actually likes to use tanning beds a couple times a week during the winter time. But I just want to talk about some of the risks around that um, and potentially what to look for when it comes to tanning beds, because we have UV light um, essentially in tanning beds and there's UVA and UVB. Okay. So UVB is what's crucial for vitamin D synthesis. Most tanning beds are going to be UVA. Okay. And UVA, when we're exposed to it for a long period of time, it can actually be very oxidative um, within the body. And to counterbalance that, we actually need red light, which is why when we're exposed to natural light from the sun, it doesn't have as harmful as an effect because we actually have the combination of red light and the UVA together. And so um, I was the Huberman podcast I listened to is actually saying that if you're going to use tanning beds, it would be beneficial for you to also do red light therapy in conjunction with that. Um, for the protective or healing benefits that um, the red light can have. And we'll talk about a little bit about the science of that as we get in deeper into red light and we talk more about that. Um, so you just have to be careful with excessive exposure to UVA. Now, UVB, as we talked about, is what actually helps um, with stimulating vitamin D production within the body. Uh, UVB also has really, uh, really great benefits around hormones. And that's another um, study that was brought up on the Human podcast where they were actually looking at um, human beings being exposed, they did it on rats and humans, and it was the same effect in both rats and humans, um, being exposed to UVB and the positive impacts it had on testosterone, on estradiol, on progesterone, and also on sexual desire and sexual passion, which is interesting, and attraction to the mate. So if you're someone who is in a relationship and you both spend a lot of time indoors behind screens and your sex life sucks, it's like maybe all you really actually need to do is get out in the sunshine a little bit more together and get some more exposure to UVB. There are some tanning beds nowadays that actually do have UVB, I believe, I haven't done a ton of research into, into that or the bulbs or anything, but I just wanted to talk about that briefly because I get this question from clients sometimes, like, is it is it bad for me to go tanning? I'm like, define bad. There's so many things that could be quote unquote bad for you. Like for me, I like to go a couple of times in the winter so I don't completely lose my tan. And I just, I feel a little bit better, a little bit more confident. So I think that the the benefits of me going for my mental health are probably going to outweigh the negative implications of going a couple times a week. But now that I'm going to be able to combine it with a red light therapy at home, I think there's probably going to have a bit more of a counterbalancing effect um, for that. So that's, I just wanted to touch on that briefly with the UVA, UVB and tanning beds, because I know a lot of people do use those. Is there anything that you want to add about that? Yeah. It's just like, you have to understand that they're isolated wavelengths, right? Like we, as humans haven't been, we, we evolved seeing the full spectrum, right? And most of us, because just how we live, thanks to essentially the industrial revolution with 24 seven days, um, we don't get that early morning sun, right? And that evening sun, which is our buffer. It's the most sacred sun. And there's, there's even groups around the world who are called sun gazers, where you could actually directly look at the sun when it's literally just rising above the horizon, because you don't have the UVA and the UVB. It's just red light, essentially, right? Near and far infrared, which is safe for the eyes. Um, so when you're doing, like you said, tanning, it's very, it's imperative that you balance it out with some red light, right? To act as that buffer. So you don't damage yourself because I believe UVA penetrates very deep in, in the sense that it promotes more aging and wrinkles of the skin. So your skin would look um, older 
Um, but this is in the context of it just being isolated and UVB would be like more for, I think, burning. But I mean, obviously you get the vitamin D synthesis as well. There is benefits that those makes the poison, obviously, but never neglecting if you're to do that, to incorporate the red light alongside it, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm still needs to do a little bit more research on the UVA and UVB. Um, my understanding of the UVB is that that's more like the blue light spectrum. And then that uh, is what we can still be exposed to even on a cloudy day. So you can still get UVB being outdoors, right? Um, even if there is some cloud cover and you're not going to get as much of the UVA if there's cloud cover. Is that correct? That I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure you still get a varying degree of both of them. Yeah. Um, obviously the clouds will still help, but sometimes it magnifies it because you can still get burnt when there's cloud cover, right? So, yeah. Yeah. I need to do a little bit more research into the different wavelengths. I was more so trying to learn about red and near infrared for this podcast, but I kind of got stuck down the rabbit hole of just light in general. Obviously it started listening to all these podcasts on like UVA, UVB. Okay. I need to learn more about this as a whole because light as a whole, as we've talked about at the beginning, like vitamin L or vitamin S, um, really key for your overall health. And I do think that it's a, a massive missing link. Like so many people that work night shifts or work in office buildings or live in concrete jungles like the city, like they don't get a lot of natural daylight exposure. And we see a rise in hormone deficiencies, like hormone imbalances. We see a rise in depression, um, in skin disorders, skin issues, like eczema, acne, all these things that are starting to become more and more normalized. It's almost like they're just something that we live with on a daily basis rather than looking for the root cause. And I think that this missing link of like daylight is actually a massive piece of that. Um, so let's talk about near and like red and near infrared and talk about some of the, the benefits of that. Um, I'm not sure if, how deeply you want to go into the science around how your different tissues can absorb red light. I know you've done more research on this than I have. Um, so if you want to talk maybe a little bit about like reactive oxygen species or ATP, anything like that, that you want to go into. Yeah. And like, like, again, I'm not a, a massive expert on this. I just have a good base understanding. Um, I would refer out to the people that we mentioned, um, specifically like Ari Witten or Dr. Joseph Marcola, he's good or Hamblin, um, Michael Hamblin, but he's very, very granular, very deep on the science, the mechanisms, because he's the one actually studying this on people and in Petri dishes. Right. So if we're looking at like the spectrum of, 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 of light, this is where things get interesting. Red light only makes like a specific part of that, right? And you have its own therapeutic benefits. And then you have near infrared light, which kind of, it, it kind of like red kind of falls into near infrared and then it kind of falls off into far infrared, right? So red would be kind of like between six, I think to seven. And then you have near infrared that kind of goes, I think it's close to like, I don't know, 12, 13, 1400. But when it comes to red light and when it comes to, near infrared light, this is the stuff that we're talking about. Red light and near infrared, they kind of go together. They're almost like, they could synonymously be used together in the same wording, I guess you could say. So when it comes to these devices out there, they're specifically isolating a specific wavelength that has these therapeutic benefits, right? The lights that we use, and we're not affiliate, affiliated with them at all, is Sonospace, right? They've been able to actually create a red light device and use specific filaments and pretty much mimic the sunlight, right? Exactly as it is, rather than just using LED diodes, like some of these devices like Jew, for example, or in infrarity, I think that's how you say it, where they're just using between like 670, which is just the red light to about, I don't know, I think like 800. Whereas the thermal bulbs from sauna space are going from pretty much 600 up until like 1500. So they're covering red light spectrum and the full near infrared spectrum, right? The near infrared spectrum is the beautiful stuff that penetrates at the cellular level. So it penetrates your tissues deeper. And I think a lot of people need a distinction here. If you go into a regular sauna, you're getting cooked from the outside, right? And you could tell because if you sit in a sauna, you're, you're gonna start sweating from all over your body. If you're using red light and red light is facing you from the front, your back is not gonna start sweating. Your front is gonna start sweating. And if you turn around, the opposite is gonna happen. It has a localized effect and it penetrates deeply. So it's not just the ambient temperature around you, it's actual the light itself with those wavelengths that's having those therapeutic benefits right mm -hmm. most most saunas are far infrared they're not near infrared because they don't use the red light technology in there that exhibits those benefits so this is where there's a lot of confusion and a lot of people are like well i can't why can't i just use a sauna because i'm sure some saunas will be developed with that kind of light therapy introduced so you're getting the red light uh, benefits but the near infrared red light is a lot more beneficial than the far infrared because it's not cooking you from the outside and it penetrates the tissues very deep, pe penetrates the, 
the dermis, the epidermis, and it pretty much goes into your cell. I think it's nine millimeters. It goes deep in, which is I think which is really I heard great. three three inches was how far the near infrared can reach. So whatever that is in millimeters, I don't remember. <laughs> That's a lot more than nine millimeters, yeah. I believe. Yeah. 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 So there you go. Yeah, about three inches um, into the body was the near infrared. Now, you guys, the red light we can actually visually see. It's yeah. like red, but near infrared, it's pretty much invisible to the human eye. And there are species of animals actually that can see infrared, like snakes, right? So they don't actually see the the human body. They see the waves that are coming off of it. Right. So if that's how some types of snakes see their prey, <clears throat> I don't know about all types of snakes, um, but I know that some types of snakes see that way. Um, it, do all snakes see an infrared? I have no clue. It's Actually, like even thermal, like in what military uses, right? They can see yeah. thermal thermal imaging. So based off of your body, your body heat gives out a signature and they could see based off of that signature and animals, snakes see that, which is pretty cool. Right. Yeah. yeah, so that that's that near infrared is pretty much invisible to us. There are some devices and some species of animals that can actually pick up on that. Um, but essentially, the mid and far is more heating, and that's what we're going to see in the sauna. And the near is not going to be as as heating, right? Um, but we we kind of want a combination of both, from what I understand. I know your bulbs have both, um, yeah. so they they look very red. Like when you're standing in front of them, they are very like red orange to color in the color. And, uh, but they do get really warm. Like I know in the morning, I usually get up and do it like right in the morning, first thing when I wake up and I'm kind of like cold getting out and I do it right before I go in the cold plunge. And it feels really good because your body does get super warm standing in front of them. So I usually stand there naked in front of the, the red lights for a few minutes. And then I jump, uh, in the cold tub. Um, so that's kind of like my process in the morning. There's, there's a lot of research around, um, red light and potential benefits for organs. So I know there was uh, there was a little bit that I was look, looking into around spleen specifically, just because I was talking about immunity, um, but there's like positive benefits around spleen. And, and interesting, interestingly enough, we have more daylight in the summer and we get less sick. And in the winter time, we get more colds and we have less exposure to sunshine. Okay, so there is benefits around red light for the spleen. Um, you were, you were talking about LPS. Is this some like recent research or is this, I know we had that conversation like this morning when we were walking, you mentioned LPS and I'm like fascinated with LPS because I, I love gut health. So. Yeah. So Hamblin, um, Michael Hamblin talked about this and he researched it in Petri dishes and rats. So when usually they want to in, induce any toxicity, um, they actually put LPS, they inject it into the rats. And then obviously they use whatever therapy they have to see if it has an in impact on that. Right. And red light has significantly shown, I don't have the study on hand, but I could show you the presentation he was talking about. And they've seen massive changes in terms of the, I guess, receding or amelioration of LPS just by using red light, not changing any other parameters, which is fascinating because we know heat and side tangent, if you want to talk about the, the C word, right. Uh, the viruses, right? So viruses can't can't survive um, essentially through red light. Like sun is super antiviral, and this is why they kept us inside. I mean, I don't want to go on a tangent and stuff, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of benefit to this stuff, and it goes way beyond just you know one of these organs. That's, are... a, that's a freaking conspiracy theory rabbit hole right there. Like yeah. there's this virus going around. We have the science to prove that being outside in sunlight can help heal and prevent these infections yet we're being told to stay inside and actually the the parks where i lived were closed which is so insane to me so insane but let's not go down that rabbit hole because that would be we'd be here for three hours like on a rant um so <laughs> red light you guys does increase uh atp production which essentially energy production within the mitochondria which is your cells like energy warehouse uh, and so it can really help with cellular regeneration because it actually improves the mitochondrial function. Um, and that's really, really powerful um, and can actually help with, I don't want to say reversing aging. I don't like to say reversing aging because you're still going to be getting older by the calendar year, but it can definitely help with, um, I want to say the regeneration of your cells and potentially slowing down how quickly your cells are are aging, right? So I don't know sure about reversing aging by any means, but definitely kind of slowing down that process. As we age, the reactive oxygen species within our cells go up um, and our ATP production goes down and red light can actually do the opposite for us where it reduces the reactive oxygen species within the cells and it, it increases our ATP. 
So really fascinating stuff. And I would say that there's a lot of benefit around this um, for people who exercise a lot for recovery. So it can help with lowering inflammation. Um, actually, there is one study that was talked about on the Huberman podcast that just blew my mind around fat loss and red light. Have you looked into that? I'm sure you have. I'm not sure the study, but I understand, I understand the mechanisms, I think. You understand the mechanism for fat loss? I actually don't understand the mechanism and I just have the stats from the study. So if you can explain the mechanism after I talk about the studies. So they were doing exercise alone um, versus exercise in conjunction with also tr being treated with red light therapy. And I need to look at the study again to see exactly how long um, they were doing it for how many times a week, like what the therapeutic dose was for them. But exercise alone in the study decreased body fat by um, body fat mass by 6%. And then exercise plus red light was 11% reduction in body fat mass. Um, and they and also, how long were they doing it for? I don't know. I need to, I need to pull it up. I have the, the study link, but I, I'm not going to open it up right now. Um, and the other one was with insulin with just exercise, 20%, uh, improvement in insulin sensitivity and or insulin response. And with exercise plus red light was 40%. So it almost doubled both. Um, which is fascinating. So if you can like deep dive a little bit into the mechanisms around that for insulin sensitivity and fat, fat loss, if you know, that would be amazing. Yeah. See, my understanding is obviously other than the, the whole idea of it warming your body up and you sweating a little bit, you have one of the mechanisms that works on is called ENOS, right? So epithelial uh, nitric oxide synthase, which is an enzyme that's the precursor to nitric oxide oxide in the body, which is something that deteriorates as we age. And that's one of the big things actually slowing people down from losing body fat, even potentially diabetes, because a lot of it is vascular, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if nutrients aren't flowing properly throughout the body, oxygen isn't flowing throughout the body, well, then you have a lot of, of how I would say, stagnation, right? And when it comes to lipolysis specifically, or burning of body fat and stimulating things like adiponectin, which releases essentially stubborn body fat around the lower abdominals or visceral body fat. Well, you can't do that without, without nitric oxide, right? So you could obviously stimulate nitric oxide without having red light doing that for you. You could take things like citrulline, malate, arginine, right? Uh, these things will do that as well, but this is like a natural, almost free way to do that. In terms of the diabetes, I, I'm sure the mechanism might be very similar uh, in terms of the blood flow, because a lot of diabetics have peripheral neuropathy where blood flow is not being delivered to uh essentially fingertips and, and toes and then potentially amputations. So if we can increase blood flow through nitric oxide, which opens up your, your blood vessels and your capillaries as well. So not only does blood flow out to the extremities work better, but it coming back to the heart and increasing pretty much stroke volume. So I think that that is potentially one of the mechanisms behind it. If there's other ones, I'm, I'm not aware of currently. So I mean, I would just say the lowering and in inflammation, right? Because that's going to take off the handbrakes that are, you know, when it comes to your thyroid, um, specifically, your, your thyroid is going to be impacted by inflammation. Your cell's ability to respond to insulin is going to be impacted by inflammation. So inflammation definitely has a negative impact on both fat loss and insulin sensitivity. And as if we can lower inflammation, that's, I'd say that's probably a secondary mechanism there as well, arguably. Um, some other things that came up just kind of around benefits, anxiety and depression, if you're someone that struggles with those and you're looking to treat it naturally and uh, potentially even wean yourself off of those medications. Now I'm obviously not recommending that you do that. And I'll, any time that we're talking on these podcasts about anything therapeutic or supplements, um, please do not take this as medical advice and stop taking your medications or even start taking supplements in conjunction with medication. That could be really dangerous. But if you're someone that, like I have a lot of clients who want to come off their um, anxiety meds or their like medications for depression, and it's not something that I can recommend or ask them to do, um, but I can only provide information around potential um, options for like, you know, that have therapeutic benefits around that. And, and light exposure definitely is one of those. I mean, there's, there's even studies in science that go to show that if you're on uh, exposed to blue light late in the evening, like after 8 PM, there's a massive impact on dopamine and that can have a really big impact on your drive and motivation and can actually be very much related to depression. So if you're someone that's on your screens, your cell phone TV, like late at night, going into the evening, um, obviously there's, there's going to be negative implications of that around, uh, potentially depression. So really interesting stuff. When you start looking at light and the impact it has, let's talk a little bit about our, our bedroom and what we did to kind of black it out because as much as, as light and red light is therapeutic and beneficial and has all these incredible benefits around organ function, immunity, um, hormones, mental health, recovery, fat loss, like all of these good things. There's also negative implications around um, light exposure, too much light exposure, too much blue light, 
and light when you're sleeping. And that's, I think, a really big one that is not well talked about. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about like how we've blacked out our bedroom? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we pretty much ordered from Amazon these, I guess, this fabric. It's a complete black. Um, they pretty much sent it to you in a kit with uh, double-sided Velcro tape. We ordered more of that. And we essentially covered the whole window sill. Uh, we got the double-sided tape, we got the measurements, and we stuck it on there, right? And obviously during the day, we kind of unpeel it from the double-sided Velcro, which would go on the window sill, and then one piece obviously on the fabric. So it's super easy. It took us maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes to set it up. And then we got double-sided black tape. I think we used the Velcro, no, double-sided black tape for like the little, little lights, because um, you have a carbon monoxide detector as well, plus we have a air filter, is it? Yeah, there's a there's an air purifier in the room. So we actually took it was just black tape, like masking black tape, tape, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, blacked out the little lights. Um, there's really fascinating studies around this. There's multiple studies around this, not just one, around how light exposure negatively impacts your sleep function. And there was one that was talked about again. I was one of the human podcasts and talking about how just one night in a dimly lit room and the lighting in the room was overhead and it was not enough light to actually impact melatonin levels, right? And it actually doesn't take a lot of light to impact melatonin levels within the body. But if you get up at, at night during the nighttime and you turn on bright lights to go to the bathroom, you'll completely shut off your melatonin production. So the lights they had set up in this room were not enough to impact melatonin, but just, I can't remember the exact like light bulbs they used. It was very dim. It impacted the resting heart rate, increase in resting heart rate. There was a decrease in HRV, which is heart rate variability. We can think of that as like essentially stress resiliency. And there was an increase in insulin resistance the next morning. That's just from one night in a room where there's dim, dim light. How many people sleep in a city with white blinds, right? And there's street lamps outside and there's a lot of light coming in. I know whenever I travel, I'm in a hotel, I am sleeping in an Airbnb. I bring my sleep, sleep mask with me, but unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, our skin is photosensitive. So there was supposed to study with the pen light on the back of the knee. Yeah. It was like the size of a nickel, a bit of a light. It was obviously connected to a device and it was put on the back of the knee. So obviously your eyes can't see it because many people, researchers hypothesize that it's just the eyes that could sense light, but that's not the case, right? You have the same uh, photoreceptors in your eyes on your skin as well. So your, your skin could literally get uh, feedback from light. And yeah, sleep was up, obviously impacted. All the stages of sleep were impacted. And I think we even talked about this too. It's like one night can literally make you a pre-diabetic. Obviously your sleep has to be seriously compromised, um, but it's pretty interesting, especially look like at the implications of like ghrelin and leptin and ghrelin goes through the roof when you're sleep deprived, which can cause this whole, whole host of complications, especially if you're trying to focus on fat loss, uh, sleep needs to be optimized. <laughs> Yeah, Jake is like a week out from a show right now and uh, has not been having the best sleep. We've been trying to figure out like the culprit for that. But um, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that factors that go into sleep. I think there's a lot of psychosomatic, um, you know, uh, potential psycho psychosomatic things around sleep for people where there's undigested thoughts or emotions or feelings or past traumas that can affect sleep function. But there's obviously the physical uh, environment of your room to be cool and to be dark is going to be so important. And then obviously working through any potential issues that are going on internally to try and help regulate your sleep as well. Um, I think that there is a ton of pressure that goes into competing and there's so much, um, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that mentally. And I know that that's definitely been impacting your sleep. So I'm hoping that after your show, you'll get back to your, your baseline in terms of, in terms of your sleep and sleep quality, but sleep has not been something that's been easier for you, for you, your whole life. I I'm kind of on the lucky side of like, I can literally fall asleep in five minutes and like, you can get in and out of bed and it won't wake me up. So like I sleep kind of like a rock. I was saying today, I'm like a little scared. Like someone could literally break into my house and I'd probably still be sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, Obi, <laughs> Obi would be too. Obi's useless. Like he's, he's yeah. definitely just like sleep through it. So, uh, yeah. So I think that's, is there anything else that you want to talk about around red light for healing? I know there's benefits around scar tissue. Um, I'm really interested in seeing how much it'll improve the scars on, um, my breasts actually, because I've had two, two breast reductions and a reconstruction. And so I have a lot of scar scars and scar tissue there. And so I'm really hoping that it can actually help improve that. 
Um, so scar tissues is, is something as well. Is there anything else that you kind of want? Oh, your eyes. That was the one thing that I wanted you to talk about the improvement that you've seen in your eyes so far. Yeah. Um, so another thing about scar tissue, um, I, I've had scar tissue in certain places, but I wasn't like, especially my ankle, because I rolled them in, from martial arts a lot and, and kicking and stuff. But um, more so with like stretch marks, I've had a lot of stretch marks from being overweight and then shrinking and then gaining a bunch of weight, specifically around my uh, chest, shoulder area and my stomach. And like literally to the point where it's so self-conscious and it's almost not even noticeable anymore. Will they fully go away? I don't know. But I know that was like one of the side effects from doing the red light and being diligent with it is like, plus obviously sunlight when it's summer, I spend, I'm not inside just doing red light all the time. I'm literally outside almost butt naked, sometimes naked tanning as many times as I can. Obviously you have to find the right place to do that. But the eyesight is another fascinating thing as I don't have the best eyesight. I didn't have the best eyesight growing up because I played a lot of video games, spent a lot of time in front of the screens, not outside. Red light was not the cure. It was a conjunction or an addition to obviously having certain exercises that I do for my eyes, obviously looking in the distance, doing palm exercises or palming your eyes to completely relax them, have no light come in. But the red light, you could even look at the red light, right? Obviously, you don't want to stare into it for 10 minutes straight. But just looking through when the bulbs are flashing at you, obviously, you want to stay away anywhere between like 15 inches usually is what they say. Plus is safe. You don't want to be any closer because that could obviously burn you. And I'm sure that could burn your retina as well. But it's fairly safe. And I've I've subjectively and objectively seen a massive difference because I wear contacts. And when I started this back, when I started doing my red light, my contacts was like both eyes was like minus five, minus 5.25 on my left. And then this was maybe like three years of doing it straight deliberately before I was like moving back and forth. It dropped down to minus three and minus 2.75 on my right. So that's I mean, massive, that's a massive difference. Yeah. It's that's a huge a difference. difference. Yeah. It's a huge difference. Yeah. So, so nice little benefit, right? Really cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated, um, with red light right now, and I'm obviously going to keep using it and hoping to see more benefits around that. And, uh, I actually have noticed that my eyelashes, because I've been doing it every morning, I've noticed that my eyelashes grow back faster and are longer. It's just kind of funny. Um, but it's like, it, it helps with hair growth too. So if you're someone that's balding, you can, I mean, potentially like hold a lamp over your head. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but, um, I don't typically put it like right on top of my head. Um, I'm standing in front of it, but I've actually noticed that my eyelashes have been uh, a little bit longer and that my skin is healing faster. So really cool. Um, and uh, obviously always a pleasure having you on the podcast here. Now we did kind of like mention some studies, you guys, and I'm going to try and pull some of those up and put them into the show notes. Like show notes is not something that I've actually done a lot on my podcast before, but I think that this like research and science is really fascinating. And that in talking about some of those studies, I want to at least provide them for you guys. So you can see that we're not just talking out our ass um, and that there's actually like real uh, evidence to back up um, what we're talking about on the podcast today. Now, there are a lot of other individuals who study light and biohackers, et cetera, out there that are going to have information on this. We wanted to kind of break it down and make it as as kind of like real life applicable for you as possible and just kind of give you some anecdotal evidence. I really wanted to bring Jake on here just because of his, his experience um, with the stretch marks, with his eyes, and also with the benefits around testosterone um, that he's seen. So um, just really cool to be able to have that conversation with you. So thank you so much again for spending your time with me and sharing the knowledge that you have on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Of course, anytime. Yeah. Um, I know you're going to be starting your own podcast here soon. So I'm excited for that because I want to obviously want to listen to it. I'll be your biggest fan. Uh, and where can people find you? He doesn't have a podcast yet, you guys, but the next time that I come on, I'm hoping that he does have a podcast so I can actually send you to his podcast specifically, but where can people find you if they want to learn more about you or what you do? Yeah. Predominantly on Instagram, jake.beast, um, Facebook, same thing, essentially Jake, my last name, Chashik. Um, I think Haley could put that in the, in the show notes, but that's where I'm most active <laughs> is Instagram. So um, just keeping busy and obviously the podcast will come. It's something I procrastinated on, but there's obviously the show and business taking care of clients is a priority right now. So yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things going on right now, just kind of quote unquote, starting your online business and you've absolutely blown up. You're at the point where you need a wait list already. So um, well, once you're waitlisted and <laughs> you're able to kind of get into a routine with everything. I feel like the podcast will come second nature to you. So thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. And uh, everyone get outside, enjoy some sunshine, and we will catch you on the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to the E3 podcast and sharing your valuable time with me. 
I hope that you learned something new. And if you found value in this episode, the number one thing you can do to support the show is share this episode with a friend that would benefit from it too. If you'd like to find out more about the lifestyle programs we offer online at Health Pillars, shoot me an email about your current situation to info at healthpillars.ca and we'll see what we can do to help. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a weekly episode. Oh, 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 oh